when you think about change making, it's people and process. You need both of those things. Hi, everyone. I'm Amy Devers, and this is Clubber. Today, I'm talking to Maria Jadis. Maria Jadis is an absolute legend in the Silicon Valley Bay Area where the tech and design worlds intertwine. She's the founder and CEO of the pioneering digital experience design firm Hot Studio, where for nearly 20 years, she built a thriving practice around the principles of human-centered design. Today, many of her former employees, aka hotties, cite their time at Hot Studios as extremely formative and can be found leading teams at Adobe, Airbnb, Twitter, Google, and more. Hot Studio was acquired by Facebook in 2013, and with that, a major signal was sent about how central design is to the experience, and therefore, bottom line, of tech. After the acquisition in 2013, Maria led global design teams at Facebook and Autodesk, building digital experiences for millions worldwide. She's also the co-author of Rise of the DEO, Leadership by Design, and the recent 2023 release, Change Makers: how leaders can design change in an insanely complex world. And now, after three decades at the forefront of business and design, Maria's new mission is to build the next generation of creative leaders, which she's doing through her executive coaching practice. When you listen to Maria, you'll hear someone who's young at heart, an old soul, an artist, a healer, and an architect of the future, all wrapped up in a denim jacket with a portrait of Prince hand-painted on it. Here's Maria. Maria Jadis. I live in Oakland, California, but I really consider myself a New Yorker. These days, I'm an executive leadership coach and applied shamanic counselor. That's these days, but we have a lot to cover to get to these days. <laughs> Where did you grow up? You say you consider yourself a New Yorker, so I'm assuming New York? Even though I've lived in California longer than any other place in my life, you cannot take the New Yorker out of the girl. Like, I'm like all in New Yorker. Melanie Griffin, working girl New Yorker. So I was born in Brooklyn in the 60s. My parents moved to Staten Island when I was like two years old, when the bridge was built, Verizon Bridge. So I lived in Staten Island. I grew up in Staten Island. I escaped Staten Island when I went to art school in Manhattan, Cooper Union, for art. So I have a degree in fine art. And that's where I discovered design. I need to know about your family dynamic. I need to know what kind of a little kid you were. What kind of trauma? (laughs) (laughs) Exactly, because you know that's foundational to who you are now. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I know when I coach people or when we do depth hypnosis, we always go back to childhood, you know, because when we get triggered, we are still going back to childhood to those moments that trigger us. There's lots of great stories about my childhood. I was that person who always was the artist. I was the class artist. I started painting when I was eight or nine years old. My parents got me painting lessons every Saturday, I would go paint. And so that was sort of my specialty as a kid. I always kind of followed my creativity, but my dream was to be a famous artist when I grew up. My uncle is Frank Frazetta, and he is like a well-known fantasy artist. A lot of people will be like, who the hell is Frank Frazetta? But if you are interested in comics or Conan the Barbarian or any of those kinds of those kind of fantasy worlds, he was sort of the guy. He was the guy. And and I looked up to him when I was a kid. So I thought I could be a famous painter as well. Okay, so then that that sounds kind of important to me. There was a role model in the family of somebody who was doing well economically in the arts. And there was not a starving artist kind of situation. It wasn't a starving artist, although my dad was still a little disappointed that both my sister and I went to art school. There was still that, hey, you're talented, but maybe you should go become a lawyer kind of thing. But if my father said to say to go, you know, left, I would go right. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. So that makes me think maybe it's not obvious, but you were a rebellious teenager. Rebellious? I'm not sure if I was rebellious. 
I was the middle child that felt largely ignored. So I think I was less rebellious, but just more wildly independent. So does that mean independent thinking as well? Did you deviate from sort of the family system in terms of their code of beliefs? I was really fortunate to grow up, even though I was born in Staten Island, which is, if you know anything about Staten Island, is very conservative. I grew up in a very progressive family dynamic. Like my father was the Republican and my mother was the Democrat. And they would constantly talk about politics, but in a more sort of lovingly way. And so I, I had that kind of dichotomy. My father was very analytical. He worked for the phone company, but I think he had this deep fantasy to become like, to be a designer or an architect. And my mother, she grew up in Brooklyn where, you know, women were, weren't raised to actually have careers, but she broke out and she started a cooking class in my house, which became wildly popular. And then we had a cooking school in the basement. And then she moved out and built a restaurant in Staten Island called Carol's Cafe. She's rebellious and entrepreneurial. And so I, I grew up in that household where there was constant fight. We were Italian, so a lot of arguments. But my mom, I think, was a role model in that, well, she's just breaking out. All her life, she was told, just be a housewife. You know, these were those years where women didn't even have credit cards to their name. And she was like, fuck you. I'm going off. <laughs> okay. I like it. So far, seems like the apple might not have fallen too far from that tree. Absolutely. So you made the decision to study fine art and dad was a little bit reluctant, but you got a good send off. It sounds like. You know, Cooper Union was free. So you can't complain when your daughter is going to a school that's tuition free for four years. That's pretty great. Talk to me about your college years in terms of studying fine art and also the newfound freedom that comes with moving out of the house and not being under your parents' roof for a while. What happened to you during those years? Man, we're really, we're going to these places that are actually really core to my personality. So when I was in high school, when I was about 15, 16, I discovered the Rocky Horror Picture Show. I bring it up because it was so important at the time because Rocky Horror was an invitation to be weird and different. And this was like the late seventies. And so it was like a blossoming. It was like a coming to age kind of movie for me where I was like, oh my God, these are my people, <laughs> these crazy people who are expressing themselves visually, sexually, all kinds of ways. I, you know, Tim Curry, I was like in love with him. So that kind of brought me into Cooper Union. It was the early 80s. It was an amazing time for art. I remember Basquiat and Keith Haring was actually drawing chalk drawings in the subway at that point. Like I, you could see the chalk drawings in the subways. Warhol was just around at every party you can imagine, right? And there were like drag queen bars. And I remember walking by a store called Love Saves the Day where they were filming a movie. And I said, so, you know, who's in this movie? What's this movie called? Oh, Desperately Seeking <laughs> Susan. It's like, oh, who's in it? Madonna. Who's Madonna? <laughs> right? So those that was the era that I grew up and it was just the best time to be in New York and the creativity and the sort of individualism was just vibrant. Like there was just an invitation to be different. And that really was a catalyst for me in college. I can totally believe that. I got to New York in 89, which I would say was on the, the end, maybe after I had jumped the shark, but it was definitely towards the tail end of that moment in time. And even I was romantic about the few years that had New York had been before I got there. It was gritty, Artists could still afford places. It was kind of just crime-ridden enough that you could do stuff without permission. <laughs> you, you know, like permits yeah, weren't yes, a thing. Exactly. <laughs> because <laughs> there were certain streets you can't go but down. But the police had bigger, <laughs> like, other things to worry about than, like, if you're following certain rules with art. Right. But you get to a point because you grow up in that sort of gritty environment where it's dangerous and creative at the same yeah. time. Right. I feel like growing up in New York during that time prepared me for anything. 
when people, I live in Oakland. It's not the safest place in the world, right? But you know what? I grew up in New York. I'm really street smart. My kids are street smart. And that prepares you for whatever comes your way. I 100% agree. I grew up Detroit adjacent, and then I went to New York City, and both of those experiences were foundational to me. And then my experience in Oakland reminded me of both of those places, and I love, love, love Oakland. It's so dense with flavor and grit and heart and creativity and scrappiness and resourceful. I just love it. So I am not surprised you landed there and you found yourself a new tribe on that, at that side of the country. Get me through your career because you became a very powerful business leader in tech. <laughs> right. I know. Who would have guessed? <laughs> There's a picture of me in the background. It's a picture of me from college. It is high hair. It's like teased tie hair with the, the hair like parted on the side, like Prince in the Revolution days. That was my persona. And then when I came to California accidentally, I went to art school. That's where I became a designer. I went, went to work in Soho for Richard Saul Werman. And he got the gig to redesign the Pacific Bell Yellow Pages. It sounds like a horrible project, but I found it to be incredibly fascinating, which is it was the only thing that connected people and communities together back in the day, the yellow pages. It was like the encyclopedia of your neighborhood. Exactly. If you were charged with redesigning it, were they reimagining the, the yellow pages? Yes, reimagining it. And I was a part of a team, right? It was also a time when I got here, 87, so I, you know, grew up, you know, old fashioned, paced up and mechanical, you know, I had a stint at Rolling Stone magazine and I came here and computers wound up on desktops within a year I was here. And it was like, you guys have to figure out what this tool means for design. It was this amazing moment. Design was going through a major transition. What does it mean to be a designer plus technology? That kind of kept me here because I was, I just sublet my apartment in New York. I was not planning to stay here. I sublet it for three years. It took me three years to realize that I actually was living here. You know, I was in denial for three years. But what kept me here was this incredible opportunity to use technology in new ways. And everybody was a pioneer. It was brand new to everybody. Everybody was trying to figure it out and sharing information. It was super exciting time to be here because everybody embraced technology early on. So I got goosebumps kind of because I'm thinking about the times that I've been involved in a kind of scene that was taking off, whether it was a music scene or an art movement or something. And there's this incredible coalescing of energy and creativity and people around it. And there's it tends to be really supportive at that time too, because you're lifting it up off the ground as opposed to competing with each other about it. It's the most exciting place to be. It's like being in a greenhouse when all the seeds are germinating. Yes, exactly. Everybody's curious, right? And trying to figure it out and nobody has a leg up. So everybody is just supporting each other. Like, what does it mean to, you know, do this thing in Illustrator to make this thing happen? And so we were doing things at the understanding business that nobody was doing before. The kind of work we were doing with the Yellow Pages, reimagining it as a community access journal uh, that people got. But then I was in charge of cartography because, you know, maps are, you know, we, we had, we did Yellow Pages for California, Nevada. So I don't know. They thought that there was, you know, like, oh, she's a pain in the ass. They, they, the people in California, my bosses didn't really get me with the high hair and the loud voice. They, they, they weren't really appreciative <laughs> of my New Yorkness. So they threw me to cartographer as if it was like the bad thing to do. And I blossomed as a cartographer. I thought cartography was such an amazing, it was like a combination of, art and design, and that every d design decision you make is a piece of information. Like the size of the typeface connotes some kind of hierarchy or the color or the, the weight of the highway. I loved it and I blossomed. And it was constant 
delivery. It's like finish one yellow page, just start the other. And every map had to be built. And so I had to build a team to keep the cadence going. And so at 24 years old, I was suddenly a creative director of like 20 people. We had to figure out how to make the maps using computers. And then we had to figure out how to collaborate so all the maps looked like one person did it. You were saying how I became a successful entrepreneur it really started with my superpower as a collaborator. And that goes back to my childhood because I was the person who threw the parties in Staten Island. I coordinated parties. I coordinated events. And so I had this ability to you know, really bring people together to believe in something bigger than themselves. And I always believed that you more brains equals better ideas equals better solutions. So you bring brains together and you pick the best ideas. I never believe that my ideas are the best ideas. In terms of coalescing people around something that's greater than themselves, did you also find that you could convert the control freaks into collaborators? Oh, good question. One of the things about being a creative director, you get to pick the people you work with. So the people with the big egos didn't really last very long around me. And I would just shut that shit down. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> Coming back to my childhood, you know, kind of that upbringing, I had a lot of confidence in myself and I knew who I was and I didn't have ego when I was a kid. And again, I believe in the power of the collective. As a woman designer, you are surrounded by so many egos constantly. I was surrounded by male egos in college. All the great designers apparently were men, right? I, a teacher literally told me that. Fuck that. It's because all the great women designers got swept under history's rug. <laughs> exactly. I was a tomboy growing up. So I always had this, I'm going to prove you that girls are better than men. I had that chip. So dealing with people with egos even in those egos that were in power, I still didn't fare well with people who were in power with big egos. Okay. Would you say that now as an executive coach, you're like hands-on with converting egos into collaborators? Well, people who come to work with me recognize that they're either going through a transition in life or the things that they're doing aren't necessarily working. So people who come to me for coaching come with a fair amount of humility. We all block. So as a coach, everybody shows up with a mask. Everybody comes with a mask, right? As a coach, you can identify the type of mask based on what scares them. I find it to be a personal victory when people actually break down and cry, because then I feel like I've gotten past the mask. I do too, not because I've made them cry, but because together we've gotten to someplace vulnerable and they felt safe enough to have a release. Because that feels not only cathartic, but like some intimacy and trust has been built. And from there, we can really work on something meaningful because we're no longer like trying to get in the door. We're, we're now in the room. Absolutely. And if they can't break down and they can't get past, you know, to be sort of really take stock and be honest with themselves and, and have some self-awareness where their saboteur is in, in charge then they're not going to be very successful from a coaching perspective, right? There has to be a certain amount of vulnerability to really get to the core and essence of what the problem is. Yeah. So people come to me, I'm going to go there. I tell them usually, you, you might be coming to me because you want advice on how to become a VP of design, but we're not going to stay there. We're going to go to other places that might be painful. So you should be prepared for that. You sound like you're you're really relishing all of the learning that's coming with these like robust challenges, cartography, computers, leading teams. Mm -hmm. So that probably sets you up with the confidence and the wherewithal and the know-how to launch your own studio, which you did and <laughs> ran for 20 years and it's pretty landmark. So talk to me about Hot Studio. Oh, you sound like it was so planned and strategic, <laughs> but alas, it was not. 
Just like accidentally moving to the Bay Area, I accidentally founded a design studio that was wildly successful. Well, okay. <laughs> I can I can believe that you accidentally founded it, but I can't believe that the success was accidental. No, no, it wasn't. I have this mantra in life. You treat everything in life like a design problem. And if you could if you have that sort of curiosity and you, you think of it as a, a design problem, you don't really get intimidated by what you don't know. Because as long as you're curious, you can actually do research and f- figure it out, which is my cavalier attitude towards, you know, running a business. I would just want to underscore that and highlight it and put an asterisk next to it, because I think so many times students and professionals in any category get in their own way when they think they should know something, they're insecure that they don't, so they don't let their curiosity lead. Instead, they sort of hide behind whatever they don't know. That is also incredibly disempowering to them because admitting Mm -hmm. you don't know something just opens the door to figuring it out. Hiding from the fact that you don't know something leaves you feeling helpless and disempowered. Absolutely. In the spiritual world, we talk about, and even in the neuroscience world, we are made of multiple parts, but there are two parts of us. There is a part of us that's we call the higher self. And, you know, a lot of people use different terms for that part of us, but that self energy is where you are curious and creative and open and optimistic, right? And in neuroscience, we call it the reward part of our brain, those parts of our brain where we light up and we're in flow, and that's where art and music lives. So that's one part. The other part is the saboteur voice, the inner critic, the shadow, the mask. You know, there are so many terms. And that part of the the brain is where the threat response is. The threat response is when you're in threat, you shut down. And we're all wired for survival. So it's fight, flight, freeze. That is in every single human being. So when I coach people, I'm like, and especially leaders, I'm like, how are you going to show up? Are you going to show up as your saboteur? Or are you going to show up as yourself? Because other people will pick up that energy and then their saboteur self will show up. I think that this is like really critically important around accessing that creative part of your brain and staying open there. And it's harder to do than it is to access the scared self. So how do we access this part of us that we all have that gives us the confidence to step into things that are new versus listening to that part of us that's saying you're not good enough, you don't know enough, you don't have the expertise. So when we listen to that part of ourselves, you're not going to get very far in life. You said something really powerful there too, is that when you listen to that part of yourself and you show up as that part of yourself, the scared part, that other people then are interacting with their scared part. So then you're setting the whole culture for your team or your organization based on everyone showing up as their saboteur. If I'm on a team, I want people who are good in a crisis and who are in flow, not the saboteurs. (laughs) So you have to show up as your as your higher self at that creative place. And, you know, kind of getting back to why I was a successful businesswoman, it really did start with this ability where I can access that higher self, that creative part of me and bring it out in others. And that becomes an attraction. It's infectious. So even though I didn't have experience running a business, I did have a, a sense of how to make money doing art. But I didn't go to business school, so I had to learn as I went. But when I decided to go out on my own, it was after the earthquake that happened here in 89. I was traveling in uh, Nepal, Thailand, India. The earthquake happened while I was out. And when I came back, like I didn't have a house. I didn't have a place to live. I didn't have any money. I didn't have a job. It's like, oh, I'm going to start freelancing. And so I started freelancing and then I got busy. I'm like, I'm busy. I'm going to hire people I know who could help. And so I started Hot Studio because I got busy and because I knew how to be a good creative director and lead others. I can bring other people in to work with me. And then it became this sort of like domino effect where we were getting busier because we were delivering really good work and the internet happened 
And that was like another pioneering moment where we were at the forefront of that. And because I brought my creative self, my higher self and inspire people to do their best work, it became this domino effect where it became attractive to work at a hot studio. I can feel it. And as you know, we've heard from uh, Sarah Brooks, who is a previous episode of Clever, that she worked at a hot studio and was profoundly impacted. An ex-hottie. Yes. (laughs) So hot studio grew and you proved yourself very handy at managing teams and delivering outstanding digital experiences. But not only that, shaping a bunch of designers along the way. And I really want to talk about your acquisition in 2013, because that is a moment in history where the good guys won. (laughs) I know. (laughs) I know. Who would have guessed that I was able to negotiate the deal of the century with my fine art background? Yes. Those dog portraits and jean jacket paintings paid off. Yeah. So I was shaping culture, learning as we go encouraging others to learn and, you know, caring about the quality of the work and the quality of the culture. And I was one of the few female business leaders running design studios, right? So that that also attracts a certain amount yeah. of people. We had an equal amount of women as men at HOT. We had a lot of diverse talent. Because I didn't have a traditional business background, if a problem came up, we would solve it creatively. Like, for example, I have two kids, I had to figure out how to lead a company and be a mother at the same time. And I would bring my babies to work with me, you know, and then I figured out how to get the support I needed while taking client calls, right? That turned into a babies at work program at Hot Studio where mothers and fathers had support before they left for maternity leave and when they came back where they could actually bring their babies and dogs because, you know, for those who are non-breeders, we're like, hey, equal rights, right? And so we had these programs that came out of creativity. We didn't have to deal with any business norms. So that was the environment of HOT. It was really uh, welcoming. It was about create good ideas. It was about collaboration. You know, we survived like multiple downturns. And then around 2013 is when my hot studio got acquired by Facebook. And it was one of the largest design acquisitions that was done at the time. It was like, again, perfect timing. And a couple of things happened during that time that is noteworthy. I think hot was around 15, 16 years old at that point. I can't remember how old it was, but it was over 15 years old because we threw a massive party (laughs) for it. (laughs) But when I was starting to approach my late 40s and hot was about 80 people. It was in two locations. We had an office in New York. We had an office in San Francisco and we had survived so many downturns. It was exhausting. Downturns are just super exhausting and scary. The company was at a size and scale where I was starting to feel like it was becoming a hamster wheel. For me personally, like I felt like I, I had a lot of growth you know, from no business experience to leading, being a CEO of a large company. I had learned a lot up until that point, but I was in my late forties and I was starting to really think ahead and going, I don't think I can handle another downturn. And I think I want to try something else in life. I I, I kept telling my employees, I'm not going to be 80 years old running hot studio. That's not going to happen. And I was always transparent with people. I was like, you know, If it's the right time and the right money and the right situation, yeah, I would sell Hot Studio. So I was clear that that could happen. And through the course of the years, there's a lot of acquiring interest for Hot over the years. And, you know, kind of getting back to sort of those ego-driven people that we know and love so well, so many of them are in the VC world, right? I would meet with these guys, no women, they were like, yeah, well, here's what your company's worth. And this is what, and I'm like, and I would sit there and I'm like, these guys have no fucking idea what, what this company is about and its value proposition. They didn't get it. They were just looking at us as numbers on a balance sheet. There were other offers, but I was not interested in any of them because I really cared about the legacy of Hot Studio and the story. And I didn't want to see the company being acquired and then dismembered 
bit by bit by bit, which is what happens in acquisitions. So I told the universe I wanted to do something different by the time I was 50. And we started working with Facebook back then. They became clients of ours. Basically, uh, at the time, Facebook only had about 50 designers in the entire company. It was early, early days. And so they were hiring hot to kind of supplement their design team. And then eventually they're like, do you want to be bought? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, right. And, and so my friend and colleague and client at the time, Margaret Stewart, she said, Hey, uh, Cheryl Sandberg wants to, uh, have coffee with you. I was like, okay, I'll, I'll drive down to Facebook and have coffee with Cheryl Sandberg. So this was around December of 2012. And I go down to Facebook thinking I'm having an informal discussion with Cheryl Sandberg. And I get whisked into a conference room with Mark Zuckerberg and Cheryl Sandberg, grilling me about why I would be interested in selling my company to Facebook. Whoa. <laughs> no preparation whatsoever. Zero. It's not like I came with a balance sheet or a deck or anything. He just straight up asked me questions and I straight up answered those questions. And eventually that led to the sale of Hot Studio to Facebook, which was in March of 2013. Do you think that was in a way that was circumventing the mask that a lot of people show up with when they go to those kinds of meetings? I think so. I think he smartly wanted to say, what is this woman about and what is her core motivation? Is her core motivation just to make a pile of money and that's it? And so I was completely disarmed and I wasn't prepped. And that was probably a really good thing. And then the negotiations happened. What I had the benefit of is I had a great team of people around me that had been with me for years. Like I had a great accountant. I had a great lawyer. I had an M&A counselor coach. I, and I also had a, an inner circle of people who have been acquired before CEOs, friends of mine, both men and women who have had the same thing happen to them. I was armed with like all of this information of experience that they went through. And so that kind of helped me understand that world of M&A and negotiate a deal that was be not only beneficial to me, but it allowed us to end Hot Studio completely on a good note. And that was important to me. Yes. No, I can hear it. And I can also imagine that being sort of whisked into that meeting and caught off guard was a good thing because you had already been thinking that you wanted to move on to something and that you, you know, you'd already really analyzed what the success and the value of Hot Studio was and how do you put a number on resilience in culture. And so you could answer those questions from the heart in a room like that. And then with this support network around you that has all the sort of background information that you might need, you can treat this acquisition like a design project and you can put together what's going to end up with the best outcome for not just you, but Hot Studio and its, you know, next chapter. Yeah. And of course, I asked for unconventional things because, again, I didn't have the rule book. Right. So, for example, there were like three pregnant women during this acquisition, you know, because they didn't take everybody. You know, they, they took a percentage of people from hot. And then there were other people who didn't they didn't take. So I made sure that I I could make sure that the people who were going had a great deal. But the people who didn't go got money and health insurance and they, they got a long lead time. So if you worked at hot for more than five years, you got a year's salary. And that's pretty wildly generous for a small company, right? And so I was really, you know, I really designed it with everybody in mind. And I also insisted that they take the pregnant women. Fuck yes. <laughs> Which technically is not legal, <laughs> but it was so important to me that we weren't going to like kick out these people who were the breadwinners who were suddenly going to have kids. So I did a lot of unconventional things. And then I say that the acquisition of Hot Studio was a Thelma and Louise moment. We went over the cliff. It ended cleanly, you know, no death by a thousand paper cuts. <laughs> and I'm super proud of that legacy. And 
what I'm super proud of is that, you know, 10 years later, the acquisition was 10 years ago. People are talking about Hot Studio, which was my hope that it was this time in their lives, the best time in their lives where they met lifelong friends, where they got to do their best work and they had a lot of fun. And, and so that's what's so deeply gratifying. And then all of these people from Hot are now in positions of power in large companies all over the world. And I tell them, and I told them then, I take complete credit for their success. <laughs> I can't stress enough how important and powerful that is, that people have such a uh, impactful and strong experience at Hot Studio that then they carry that with them out. And then the positivity that's cultivated in Hot Studio around making change gets disseminated out to other corporate cultures and therefore the world because of these people that are out there in positions of leadership. And you are also really instrumental in ushering in the era of design leadership, both because of writing the rise of the DEO, but also because this acquisition sort of signaled the value of bringing design in-house. The acquisition of Hot Studio made the news. And I like to say it was the oh shit moment for technology. It wasn't Hot Studio. It was at that time, technology companies like Facebook had this oh shit moment that because customers were demanding good experiences. Thank you, iPhone. That was a seminal moment for us. When, when the iPhone came out, it changed everybody's requirements for what good design can do. And things had to be more intuitive. They had to be more customer focused. And all of these companies were like, oh, it's not about cool technology anymore. It's about user experience. And we don't have people who know how to do that. And so it created this like buying spree of design companies. And Hot Studio wasn't the first to go. It was a very powerful moment to have a company of that size being acquired by a technology company. It just set off years of acquisitions for design studios. And around that time, actually, The Rise of the DO, which was my third book, when I was the CEO of Hot Studio, so it must have been a year before or even 20, I think it was 2011, and I was at Hot Studio, I was asked to give a TEDx talk. And I was like, you know, I don't do anything special. I don't know what I'm going to talk about. And I had a, a coach at the time. The name of the company was called Tech Talks. Christy Danes, Kevin O'Malley ran this company and they were like my speech coaches. You know, I was giving a lot of talks. So she looked at me and said, Maria, you run companies differently than anybody that we've ever worked with. Like, I didn't know that I ran companies differently, right? She's like, you know what you are, Maria? You are a DEO. So I have to give credit to Christy Danes, who coined the phrase DEO, Design Executive Officer. And that became the basis of that TED Talk I gave in 2011, where I said rather provocatively that designers have special superpowers, that when you apply them out of the context of design and into business, those are going to be the, the future leaders of America. Those are going to be the powerful leaders of America. The, the superpowers are being a change agent, being a risk taker, using intuition, being a systems thinker, being people-centered, and getting shit done. Those were like the, the qualities, right, that designers have. And if you apply those qualities to the business world, you are going to get much better leaders. And that was the provocation in 2011. And then one of my partners in crime, Christopher Ireland, who's a woman, she was CEO of a company called Cheskin. She was one of my mentors around acquisition. She had sold her company, Cheskin, a year or two before me to WPP for a shitload of money. And she saw me give that TED Talk and she said, there's a book in it. Let's do a book together. Oh, that's how it came together. So we collaborated and then the book came out in 2013, around the time that I was at Facebook. It talked about design at the executive level. And here we are 10 years later, and you see design now in some of the top levels. So a little bit of a prophecy there. And I'm so glad that Rise of the DO was a rallying cry for people about like the power of design. So like if you fast forward 
the book that I'm doing now, Change Makers, that just came out in January. It's it's almost like a sliver of the DEO, that change agent on steroids. So I, I kind of say that being a change maker is next level up leadership. Yeah, that makes sense. When I say leader, I'm not saying that you have to be a VP of design to be a leader. Leadership is in all of us. And being a change maker is at any level of the organization. It's a mindset and a strategy. And I think there's something underscoring your definition of a change maker that's important to call out right now, which is that this doesn't mean like leading the business to more success for their bottom line. Being a change maker means using the organization to serve the public and doing that in a way that's mutually beneficial so that it creates a a healthy feedback loop and a reciprocal relationship and positive change is being implemented in the world through the arm of the business. Yeah, that is the hope. But everybody is on their own path in terms of what their core motivation is. But part of being a change maker is that people centeredness and caring about people and kind of going back to what I was telling you about, like that reward versus threat response. Like this is this is in the book around change starts with you and how you show up. When you think about change making, it's people and process. You need both of those things. The big learning I I got from these last couple of years around through coaching and also through the research of change makers is a lot of people have this relentless focus on the customer or the product or whatever they're doing. We don't do as good as a job paying attention to our peers or our bosses and what their needs and wants are. I mean, there's all this age old discussion about designers have to speak business. Well, no, designers as all change makers need to be multilingual. Because if you can really detach what people are, the words that they're using and get to what they're trying to achieve, if you can get through that layer and look at what the shared purpose and goals are, you can be operating on a very different level. That's true in society now. Today, we are so divided. We have very different differences and belief systems. But I don't inherently believe that most people are that don't agree with me are evil. And I have to say, it takes a lot of discipline to not believe that in today's world. It does. You had a head start in a family that was lovingly bipartisan. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was lovingly, yes. lovingly. It's not so much now. And so this is where, okay, the shamanism's coming in, learning more about empathy and compassion for others. You know, if you do have that asshole boss or you have a stakeholder that you just can't get along with, I often ask my clients, what scares those people? Why is their threatened self showing up to be become that asshole? What are they hiding behind? What is scaring them? How are you fueling their fire? Right? And if you can kind of get deeper and say, okay, what do they need to get out of this? What do I need to get out of this? Even in a marriage, right? What do we need to get out of this? What's our shared humanity? Let's start there. And then we can, we can kind of separate the differences and start talking about them without being so charged about it. Or defensive. Defensive charge. Because if you, again, if you're working with that triggered self, you're going to get a different answer than if you were working with that part of them that's creative and curious. You know, empathy is a huge piece of it, but I think there's also a kind of acknowledgement or reverence for the fact that everybody's kind of on their own path and in their own stage of development. You know, you may have been there in the past. You know, everybody's kind of on their own timetable too for their own personal development. Yes. And I think when I started to allow for that in all of my interactions, I started to have a lot more success just in circumventing whatever it was that was getting in our way and getting to a place of sort of mutual understanding a lot faster. I love that mutual understanding. Change is scary for people. And it depends. It could be a reward, like I'm getting married, or it could be I, I just got fired, right? And so there's a core emotion attached to that event. And so we need to be understanding and compassionate that people have their own response to change and they have their own path in terms of, of self-realization, self-actualization, in terms of how that change will have an impact on their lives. So we need to really realize that there's differences there. Do you have some advice for somebody who might be going through change to just 
sort of recognize maybe where they're getting triggered and how they might be able to guide themselves or soothe themselves through the change? Because you don't want to resist it. And that's what happens normally. Like we clamp down and resist it. In 2018, I was the VP of Design and Autodesk. I was a change maker. I was killing it. I was navigating change at scale. I was helping change hearts and minds. I was advocating people-centered design. I was doing all the things. And I felt like I was in flow. And I loved the CEO. I loved my boss, Amar Hans Paul. He was the chief product officer. He gave me a lot of latitude. He got me. Both Carl and Amar got who I am. And I felt like I could be authentically me in this company. And then Carl decides it's time to retire. And then the shit hits the fan at that level, right? The CEO steps down, new CEO comes in, who actually knew me and liked me. He was in the company already. But he basically, when he became CEO, in a very honest way, was like, you know, I respect you, I like you, but I don't think your role's that important to the company right now. It's not that important. Design's not that important. It's not as important as you think it is. Basically, there's no need to have a, a, a an executive design leader kind of thing, right? It, the, his focus was different. I can't fault him for that. I was pushed out. I was fired. I was laid off. You know, fill in the, the, the cute little name that people want to say, right? And it was utterly devastating to me. We've been talking about my incredible career up until this point, because I'm like a friggin' hyperachiever, always had to get 100% on the report card kind of girl. And suddenly it's like I had the scarlet letter on me. It was like, oh my God, the F word, it happened to me. It's weird because it's not even because they said you fucked up or you did a bad job. It's because they're saying, we don't think what you do is that valuable. For the business at that time. And this is what's happening now anyway. People are getting laid off left and right, not because they didn't do well, is because the business doesn't value what they're bringing in this point in time, right? And that happens. So I got laid off. It was like November 2018 or something like that. And I was giving a keynote talk in January here in San Francisco for Invisible Talks. And it was, go it was going to talk about my great career in, uh, as a successful VP of design at Autodesk. Oh, shit. Right? That was like, that was, that was the talk I was going to give. Here are all the amazing things that I was able to accomplish at Autodesk. I went through this real depression, as we all do when these kinds of events happen to us. This was like traumatic for me. So for the talk, I decided this is something I don't want to hide. I'm feeling shame and anger and all of these emotions. And so I didn't tell the conference organizers what I was going to do, but I basically turned the talk into, here's a summary of what I did at Autodesk. And by the way, I'm, I just got fired. And I said this to the group and it was like, oh, yeah. And then I said, how many of you have left a job when it wasn't your decision. Most of the people in that group raised their hand. And it was just an, it was like, okay, this terrible thing happened to me. I'm going to, I'm going to let it free. I'm going to use it as a source of strength for me. And so I, I got really curious about, okay, I did, I was so proud of my accomplishments, but yet it yielded in getting fired. What could I have done differently? And that's why I decided to get curious again. And I'm like, I'm going to interview other people who are doing this role that, you know, again, I learning on the job, what did I do right? What did I do wrong? And that's embarked me on doing these interviews, which became the basis of change makers. This book is really a collection of stories from over 40 people like Sarah Brooks, who shared their vulnerabilities being in situations like this. And that became the content for the book. You know, that's, in, I'm getting really moved right now. That's incredibly powerful because in order to be a change maker, you have to also be brave enough to go where ple people don't want you necessarily yet. They don't want you to force them into change. And so there's a lot of resistance and that can come out in rejection or roads blocked or lots of different ways that you're sense of self can get lacerated. <laughs> 
Absolutely. And then the book I was telling you about, at the same time, I picked up this book called Managing Transitions. And because I was like, why am I so sad and angry? And like, I can't get my emotions uh, together. And the book talks about whenever there is an event, a change in your life, whether it's even good news or bad news, it triggers grief. It triggers the stages of grief. And that's, you know, the anger, the, uh, the doubt, the uh, acceptance, the bargaining, the whole thing. And it's not linear with grief. Grief is not linear. You go up and down. You can be angry and then you could be bargaining and then you could be, you know, avoiding, you know, all of those stages. And it basically says for any kind of stages of grief, you can't rush it. You have to move through it. You have to let yourself grieve. It's okay, but you are grieving because you are grieving the life that you had to step into a life that you that's unknown to you. And that's scary for anybody. And so it starts with that stage. And then once you pass through grief, you hit this stage called the neutral zone. And I like to define it as you are lying in a coffin in above ground waiting for your soul to rise. And you don't know how long you're going to be in that coffin. You might be there for six months. You might be there for a year, but you are like processing. You get through these emotional processing and you start getting to this point where you are trying to figure out what's next for you. And then there's a moment of clarity that happens and it's called post-traumatic growth. This happens and it, it, it happens in trauma patients where there's a moment of clarity and the creative part of your brain gets sparked. And when you get to this moment of clarity, new synapses form, and that's where new beginnings start. Once you can clear the voices out in your head, and once you get to this neutral zone, you can start thinking about what's possible in life. You can start really accepting and, and getting excited about what's possible. And so this is in that book. And I highly recommend it for anybody who's going through a transition in their life to pick that book up because it gave me a framework to understanding why I was feeling what I was feeling during this time of transition for me. That, thank you for that. That sounds incredibly helpful. And it made me think that one of the places so many of us get stuck is in that stage of like, why can't I just get over it? I shouldn't be feeling this way. And if you do that to yourselves and deny and push down the feelings, then you're not actually moving through the grief. And the grief is just always going to be there, like waiting to be dealt with. Yeah, it is. You have to move through grief. You can hide it. You know, shame is where it happens here. And you just got to give yourself time to go through it. You know, for me, it involved a lot of massages and going to the beach and staring at the water. I needed to do that in order to move through the grief. So you got to do what you need to do to kind of get through it. You're probably a much better executive coach having gone through that. Yes. And getting fired too. I think of everything in life as a gift, the bad times as well as the good times, because it's, it's all about lessons learned. I ask the universe, what do I need to learn from this bad experience? Going through that experience of being fired has really helped me deal with people who are getting fired right now. It helps during this time of transition, right? That neutral zone piece where you can you, you start thinking about new possibilities. You, this is what happens to people. They get really scared when they, lo they lose a job and they start immediately feeling like, oh my God, I'm never going to work again. I'm going to become all these voices in their head. And they, you know, then you start going after these recruiters and it becomes an anxious, scary time where you're speaking to recruiters. And I went through that too. I was like, oh my God. I have to continue to be a VP of design. I have to continue making a shitload of money. If I pause, I'm going to become irrelevant and people are going to forget me and not know who I am anymore. I went through all of those discussions in my head and I was at a party. I remember like it was a party and Clement Mock, who is a well-known designer. He worked for Apple back in the Steve Jobs days. He sold his company to Sapient. He was one of my mentors when I my company got acquired. He's kind of like a reserved guy. You know, it's not like you would expect to get like monumental advice from him. I was talking to him about like, oh my God, I'm going on these interviews with Google and Twitter and you name, you name it, right? 
And I was telling him, you know, I, I feel like I'm faking it. I'm worried. I don't think I care about technology anymore. What happened to me? I don't care. You know, and he looked at me deadpan. He's like, why are you doing this? You sold your company to Facebook. You don't need the money. And that's a gift. Why are you doing this? You have worked your whole life since, since the time you graduated college. Why don't you just stop? <laughs> I didn't even think about that. It wasn't a consideration because my brain was saying, go, go, go. You got to keep going or you're going to be forgotten. It was like, yeah, why am I doing this? And so I said, I'm going to cut off the calls with the recruiters. I, I like, I cut the faucet. And so this is the, that being in that neutral zone. I'm like, okay, who am I becoming? Who am I now? If I'm not a VP of X, if I'm not making this, if I'm not traveling the world and doing all the things that that life gives you. And the, I took stock of my life and I looked at my career. This is really helpful for coaching because we all keep thinking of the career ladder that I'm here and then I have to go a rung up. And I, you know, this is constant like moving up kind of metaphor. So I decided to look at the through line of my career. I was like, okay, when I look at my career, rather than what's next, what did I love to do the most? Going back to that time when I was 24 years old, trying to figure out cartography, working with a group of curious people, what I love to do the most is to bring out the best in people and help them achieve great things. That was the through line. My whole life, I get the most enjoyment out of helping others be successful. And that's why I became a coach, because it was that realization that it wasn't about, I love great design and I love art and I still do calligraphy and art and all the things that I do. At the end of the day, it was never really about the thing. It was about the people making the thing and having them do their best work. Hallelujah. I mean, I can completely relate as a, I'm trained as a furniture designer, at, but I make a podcast because what my favorite thing to do is have meaningful conversations with people who are making the world a better place and sharing those conversations with others so they can connect to the built world in a more meaningful way. When I realized that's what I wanted to spend my days doing, then I just designed myself a job to do it. <laughs> yeah, treating everything like a design problem. And I truly do love celebrating people. Like, that's my favorite thing. I think people are fascinating and what they do is amazing. So anyway, I totally understand how you got to where you are and that it's not about the thing. It's about the people who do the thing. So talk to me about the coaching because I'm fascinated. A lot of people have a lot of different ideas about what coaching is, right? Depending on whether you're talking about athletics or life coaching or spiritual coaching, but it sounds like you kind of mix a little bit of all of that. I have a pantry of things. I, I really do. Including like hypnosis and, sh and shamanism. Yeah, it's all part of it, right? And so I was going through this sort of transformation during the pandemic. I got curious about coaching, but also I wanted to take coaching classes largely because I realized also with the through line of my career that I'm really good at talking, but not very good at listening. My husband could double down on that. He constantly has caught me not listening to a damn thing that he was saying, right? So he has caught me. Listening is a lot harder than people yeah, think it is. It is. It's super hard. It requires discipline. So I started taking classes to learn how to ask better questions and to learn how to listen with intentionality. And I got really curious and interested in it. And then I just kept taking more classes, just like accidentally moving to the Bay Area. I was like, oh, this is interesting. I'm going to take this class now and this class. And then I took all the classes and it's like, okay, you took all the classes. Do you want to like become certified as a coach? You know, it's like, do you want to commit? You know, we've been dating. Now, do you want to really make it official? Then I went down the certification route for coaching. But when you start going down coaching path where you're, it's really about listening to people, checking in with their energy, getting to their core to motivations, like there's a lot of expertise that gets into doing the coaching practice. It's like an onion. It's like once you start learning about coaching, you start learning about neuroscience and you start understanding sort of the brain mechanics and your body mechanics, how, how that has an impact on your behavior. 
and how you show up and all that. And that's super interesting to me. And then there's the somatic stuff. It's like, oh, wait, how is all of this stuff showing up in your body? So you can learn all about that, right? And then it's like, oh, and then you can coach individuals. How does that apply to coaching teams, which is different than facilitating teams? It's coaching teams and looking at team dynamics. And then shamanism was a lot of coaching is connected to yourself and spirituality. So when we talk about self energy, we're talking about you can you can define that as your soul, right? You can define it as a part of you that is that's connected to your brain that fires creativity. Some people put themselves closer to God, you know, when it comes to that. Or you can say there are like spirit guides that are guiding you. And one of those spirit guides is your higher self, right? There's all sorts of ways to get to that self, either through science or through spirituality. So then I got curious about spirituality and I grew up. Catholic in Staten Island. I had, let's just say I just had really bad role models when it came to religion. Like I did not subscribe to Catholic ideology at all. And so I never considered myself religious, but I've always considered myself spiritual. I've always considered myself that there is something there. There is a higher power that we can't just explain. And so spirituality gave me that pathway into like really understanding spirit and how do you use spirits, which are could be considered parts of you? How do you access those good parts of you to go to places that can be potentially scary that have to be unlocked? Those places of trauma that happened in our childhood. Or it could be things that you brought in from another lifetime, if you believe that. Or it could be a lineage line, like people from the Holocaust, like people who are Jewish today still have that trauma from the Holocaust that they carry over from one generation to another. Right. And it's both learned and epigenetic. Absolutely. So, so the shamanic work and the depth of gnosis is a way to guide people into their inner spirits, their inner soul, their inner self, and try to understand where the pain is and try to heal the pain or lessen the pain. So when that pattern arises with them today, they have, a, they have a connection to why they're triggered. So a lot of triggers are connected to something that has happened to them that has to be dealt with and not swept under the rug. So we kind of talked about how people hide things. Doesn't mean they go away. They just get hidden. And then they get re-traumatized through the way you behave. Could you think of parts of you, things that trigger you, where it's like, oh my God, why am I so triggered? Why am I annoyed by this person? <laughs> yeah, I've gotten to a place where I can kind of name. When I realize I'm triggered, I can trace it back to what is at the root of it. And I'm like, oh, that's that part of me. And I just need to like understand that and understand that I'm triggered. And I can also calm myself down and then, you know, move through it. But until you understand that or even are able to recognize that you're triggered, and you're not focused on the external thinking like that person did something wrong to me. And so I have every right to be feeling this. If As long as you're sort of recognizing and able to name it, you can get closer to it and you can start to be kinder and more compassionate to it. Yes. Yeah. See, I don't know if you've studied any, any work on, in this part, but you know, there's some like great stuff like internal family systems talks about parts work and I do want to shout out to Sacred Stream here in the Bay Area. Isu Gucciardi is the one who has, and the Sacred Stream Foundation does these incredible classes when it comes to energy healing. Again, like you could just take a class and get curious. And if you're interested, take another class. And it might take you down a pathway that you did not expect in life. Because again, a girl growing up in Staten Island, carrying around sage sticks and clearing spray that's that's a far cry from that girl with the high hair <laughs> i don't even i can't believe it myself that i have crystals i don't know okay? i don't know let's <laughs> let's trace it back that high hair you said it was kind of like prince and if we think about prince he was clearly spiritual he was clearly he could speak to god and the devil at the same time right he could get into the shadow and be transcendent I don't know. I think it's a natural progression. Honestly, if you start with Prince, you're going to get 
<laughs> to yeah. the beautiful afterlife. <laughs> And we didn't even talk about Prince. I mean, I have like a Prince tattoo oh, right here. Oh my goodness! <laughs> <laughs> we have to have we have to talk more deeply. We have a whole other conversation about yeah, that. Yeah, we can we can just do this every <laughs> week. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, before I I let you go, is there is there anything that we haven't talked about that you feel like is important to share? I also belong to this activist group called Flip the Vote, and we've been doing it for a couple of years. Small group of ragtag people started it here in the Bay Area, and it's a small group of people who invest in grassroots organizations across the country to help underrepresented people get out and vote. So we target certain states and we fund grassroots Areas like in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and Georgia and North Carolina, Arizona, we fund these grassroots people who go door to door and build relationships with underrepresented populations to make sure that they have a voice during elections, both local level and federal level. And I'm bringing this up because we have a mantra there. It's so easy to get depressed with what's happening in the world right now. I look at my two kids, 20 and 23, and I look at their generation, and that generation is what gives me hope. And hope is a discipline, because even though things are bad right now, I'm seeing younger generations all over the country, kids who are being sort of villainized or cast aside or punished thinking about Zoe from Montana and the two Justins in Tennessee, like these are young, young people who are standing up for what they believe in. And even though it's hard for them right now, the fact that they're there gives me hope that that generation is going to turn things around. So I guess I want to end with hope is a discipline. And I believe in hope. I believe in progress. Even though there are setbacks, you got to realize that you've set a stake in the ground for somebody else to take it and move, push it further. And so that's how I want to end with is hope is a discipline. That's brilliant. I love that you're ending it on a hopeful note. And I agree with you as, as an educator, I, you know, I work with college students and I see how they take care of each other and how they accept each other. And it gives me a great deal of hope and you have to choose it. You have to actively choose hope. It is a discipline and a practice. And I love that you've, you've honed it and you've shared it with us and you've left us feeling much more optimistic. Oh, good. Maria, you're a powerhouse and an inspiration. Thank you so much for sharing your story, your philosophy, and all the ways that you, you know, work your magic in the world. Oh, uh, it's so much fun. If my story could inspire somebody else, then it's all worth it. Hey, thanks so much for listening. For a transcript of this episode and more about Maria, including images of her work and a hand-painted jean jacket with an under-the-cherry moon era prince portrait, and a bonus Q&A, head to cleverpodcast.com. If you can think of three people who would be inspired by Clever, please tell them. It really helps us out when you share Clever with your friends. You can also listen to Clever on any of the podcast apps, please do hit the follow or subscribe button in your app of choice so our new episodes will turn up in your feed. We love to hear from you on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter. You can find us at Clever Podcast, and you can find me at Amy Devers. Please stay tuned for upcoming announcements and bonus content. You can subscribe to our newsletter at cleverpodcast.com to make sure you don't miss a thing. Clever is hosted and produced by me, Amy Devers, with editing by Rich Straffolino, production assistance from Ilana Nevins and Anushka Stefan, and music by L1011. Clever is a proud member of the Surround Podcast Network. Visit surroundpodcasts.com to discover more of the architecture and design industry's premier shows.